Hello everyone, my name is Dr Paul Rose and in this presentation I'd like to talk about some key concepts in biological psychology, environmental and physiological control of behaviour. I'm going to use some model species to explain how physiology and the environment both come together to influence what animals do. Changes in the environment can change how the endocrine system operates within an animal's body. Fluctuation and suppression of different concentrations of hormones influence an animal's activity pattern by changing its morphology, its size and shape, by changing the types of behaviours that it needs to perform, and by changing the motivation, the particular states that the animal is in when it's performing these behaviours. These changes in motivational aspects influence the priorities an animal places on the different performances of different behaviours and this can be reflected in these changes to physiology and in morphology too. The red deer stag in this photograph is probably one of the best examples of how environmental and physiological changes influence what an animal looks like as well as its behaviour patterns at different times of the year. The deer rut is probably one of the most one of the most obvious examples of a physiological control over behaviour and how an animal's endocrine system changes not only its own morphology but also its time activity budget too. The physiological control of behaviour, such as the deer rut, is timed precisely to season to ensure that the stag's courtship display has the biggest gains for the individual. It's easy to see this physiological change in action. This fallow deer stag is bellowing out a message of his own quality to outcompete other males. So let's put all of this into a bit of context. What have you seen that stag doing? You've seen that stag performing a particular behaviour. Behaviour is a way of looking at key aspects of the psychology of the human and the non-human animal. Behaviour is always an observable response to a stimulus. We can see what's going on, we can measure and record that response, and we can compare that response to the variables around the animal that come from the environment and that are influencing what the animal does. The animal is interacting with internal and external cues and therefore is directing the most appropriate performance relative to that situation. Behaviour is coordinated by the link between the nervous system and the endocrine system. So this helps us further understand exactly why behaviour is performed in a particular way by particular individuals. Here's an example of how we go about recording animal behaviour. Animals basically perform two types of behaviour. Those that are long duration, we call these states and those are short duration, and we call those events. In the case of my rutting stag, his state behaviours can be moving, the act of going from one place to another, grazing, the collection of food, ruminating, which is when he chews the cud, resting and sleeping, comfort or relaxation behaviours, rutting, which is his act of courtship display, and vigilance, where he looks out for danger. Those are all long duration behaviours that we can time and put into what we call a time activity budget, which tells us about the amount of time proportioned to those behaviours and time equates to energy and therefore motivation. His event behaviours, these short duration activities that we would count and record as a frequency, could be chasing of other individuals, the vocalisations that you've heard, scratching himself, interacting with other individuals in short, sharp durations, or tail flicks or ear flicks that might give clues to his mood and underlying motivations. These short duration event behaviours, again which we can't time, help us understand the context of the state behaviours. So we can time our state behaviours at the same time as counting our event behaviours and comparison of these observations in a particular scenario tells us a lot about the underlying reason of the behaviour 
why it's being performed in that manner, and which behaviours are most highly motivated to be performed at that particular time. So what's this got to do with psychology? Behaviour is a neuroendocrine response, the way in which the body responds to a stimulus from the environment and how it directs that response to be most appropriate. Behaviour is linked to both physical and psychological stimuli and consequently by understanding hormonal or endocrine control over behaviour at particular times of year we can work out the evolutionary processes as well as the cognitive functioning that can occur behind these types of behaviours. You can hear the stags roaring behind me in those video clips. That roaring behaviour is an excellent example of the change to time activity budget at a particular time of the year that's caused by changes to the animal's endocrine system. Outside of the rutting period, deer are relatively silent. Stags only roar when they're proclaiming their territory, proclaiming their ownership, as it were, over their group of hinds, the female deer, and therefore that behaviour is not needed outside of the rut. The females, the hinds, are the ultimate driver of this behavioural change. They are the ones that are driving the processes of natural and sexual selection that are influencing the characteristics of this species overall. Their choices into what they determine as attractive and adaptive for the next generation cause the evolution of the traits that we see in the stag, the roaring behaviour, the patrolling of the groups of females and the roaring of a message of his quality to others. She would like her sons to possess all of these adaptive qualities of looking as desirable and as strong and powerful as possible as the stag that she has chosen as her mate. Her daughters will inherit her sense of choice for those good qualities. So therefore female choice based on how she would like to pass on the best quality genes to the next generation is driving these sexually selected characteristics that the stag that the male deer possesses. That's why, regardless of what he is doing, it's ultimately the female who is in control, in this scenario at least, as to who is going to be successful at breeding and influencing the qualities of the next generation. On the outskirts of the harem, controlled by that stag with the loud voice and enormous set of antlers, is this group of younger stags, much smaller in stature, with much smaller antlers, with fewer points on them. These young stags are waiting their time for that larger, more impressive male, who is currently in control of the harem, to get tired and exhausted, lose his control over what everyone is doing, thus giving these younger challengers a chance to sneak in and mate with the females. Over time, over experience of subsequent ruts, these stags will gain in weight and in confidence and they will grow larger sets of antlers each year. Their voices will deepen and their roars will carry further and therefore they can become more attractive to the females. They can potentially be in control of a harem. So by biding their time and assessing the competition, before they jump in and attempt to challenge that lead stag for control of those hinds, they are able to assess the situation and see where they're likely to get an opportunity for breeding. This shows you that even though an endocrine response has occurred, which has changed the animal's morphology, it's made it grow antlers, it's made it attempt to compete with other males, the social environment is still important on the behaviours that are displayed even during the deer rut. Therefore, it can be quite difficult to unpick all of the variables that influence exactly what animals do and why they do them. We need to observe and measure behaviour across all of the different conditions that it occurs in, in an attempt to find out just why things are happening. This new paper by De La Pena and colleagues on the Iberian population of the red deer 
shows the role of the social environment in the development of these sexually selected traits in a lot more detail. It also gives you an idea of the complexity of unpicking hormonal, social and wider environmental influences on behaviour. Please do take the time to read over the abstract that I have provided. The dark ventral patch, as illustrated by the blue arrow on the photograph, is a characteristic feature of red deer stags during the rut. For those stags, in periods of intense competition, i.e. with more males around to cause competition for females, this darker patch was more pronounced. In populations with fewer males, where there was less competition, there was a reduced chance of the stags developing this ventral patch of darkened colour. Consequently, not only is testosterone controlling the development of the stag's features for courtship display, i.e. his antlers, is also influencing other aspects of its courtship behaviour as well. The development of this ventral patch in responses to different levels of competition. But then so is the change in the social environment also mediating what the stags look like. Only under these heightened levels of competition, where there are more stags around, is this extra characteristic of the rut, this dark tummy patch, being produced by the stags that are under that particular social condition. These stags, at the end of the rut, are tired and exhausted from constant battles with other males, constant challenges for their females, and putting all of their energy into the courtship display at the expense of maintenance behaviours like feeding. Antler is the fastest growing bone in any vertebrate body. Stags go through a period of seasonal osteoporosis as they strip calcium from their own skeleton to shunt it into their growing antlers. This physiological challenge causes them to be thoroughly run down by the end of the rut and requires a long period of recuperation. This is why antler grows over the spring and summer with lots of fresh grazing, of really good quality nutrition to enable the stag to put on condition ready for the next rut in the autumn and winter. You can find some really useful description of the hormonal control of rutting behaviour in red deer in the older literature. This paper from the 1970s, for example, explains the link between testosterone, the development of the stag's antler and aggressive behaviour, and consequently, the way in which the rut is controlled hormonally. In autumn, stags become aggressive and they start to court their females, and at the same time as this, interactions between males increases as competition becomes more commonplace. This can be experimentally tested by looking at the behaviour of castrated stags. Those that have been castrated do not fight or do not attempt to mate with the hinds. But if you artificially replace their levels of testosterone with an implant, you restore this aggressive, competitive rutting behaviour. Again, in this older paper, you can see the importance of seasonality of the different time of year and the reproductive changes in red deer that are driving their behaviour. This annual cycle of reproductive activity in the stag was considered to be controlled principally by daylight length and was associated with changes in the pituitary gland and the adrenal gland and the thyroid gland. There were also pronounced changes in the body weight, which were a direct consequence of rutting behaviour. Therefore, as I've said previously, changes to the animal's morphology, its size and shape, are influenced by fluctuating levels of hormones that are occurring because of the release of these hormones at particular times of the year, as well as how the animal's behaviour is directed outside of the rutting season. Stags spend the majority of their time grazing to put on condition outside of the rut. 
And therefore, when they get to the rut itself, these physiological changes can enable them to use all of that energy, all of that condition they have built up over the summer in their attempts to be as successful as possible at gaining the highest number of matings across the highest number of females. And what this graph shows from the same paper is changes in pituitary, adrenal and thyroid weight, as well as the girth of the stag's neck and the mane length, the shaggy hairs that grow on the stag's neck in and out of the rut. And you can see there are changes in how adrenal activity prepares the animal for the rut, as well as how the changes to morphology, the size and shape of the stag's neck occurs during the rut itself. The animal's endocrine system is preparing itself to enable the behavior that is performed to be as useful and as valuable as possible to that individual within that particular behavioral context. So the motivation of the stag to feed during the spring and the summer is controlled to enable the animal to have enough energy, enough condition to last the course of the rut when it requires the use of these traits that it has been growing, i.e. the antlers. And you can see that illustrated on the graph where there is the differences between hard horn and soft horn. And consequently, if the animal's behavior is standardized or the same all year round, the use of those antlers would be diminished. The stags would not be able to fight or compete. And therefore, this whole organized courtship behavior simply wouldn't function. So useful is this hormonal control of behavior within this specific social and seasonal context to the courtship display of the stag that it's highly conserved across all deer species. These are not red deer, but another species of deer in another genus, another taxonomic group. The stag still grows antlers, the stag still displays to the females, and the stag still controls a harem of females whilst driving off other males. And I hope you can see in this video that the stag was thrashing his antlers around in a show of dominance. Again, that's only performed when the stag is in hard antler as a show of strength to others. Of course, it's not just stags that have a refined control of behavior due to environmental and hormonal conditions. A whole range of animal species control their behavior patterns based on changes to physiology that are conducted according to information that is being taken from the external environment. Some of the best studied examples of this outside of mammals occur in migratory birds. What you can see in this figure is testicular growth rate of three species of migratory bird, the Japanese quail, the European starling, and the white crowned sparrow. And this graph shows that increasing testicular growth rate correlates beautifully with increasing photo period. Birds that migrate direct that behavior based on environmental cues that tell them when resources are going to be more accessible. One of the best environmental cues that migratory birds can use are changes in light levels. As days lengthen, so food supply becomes more available and therefore conditions for breeding are more opportune. Because birds fly and travel across long distances, they don't want to carry the extra weight of a reproductive system at times of the year when that reproductive system is not going to be used. So consequently, the hormones within a bird's body, atrophy and hypertrophy, they shrink and grow the reproductive tract in and out of the breeding season. So that when these birds are migrating, their reproductive tracts are smaller and lighter, and therefore they save energy during their migration across long distances. So that when they get to their breeding grounds, they can switch their physiology on of their reproductive system, grow their reproductive tract, and then breed successfully. Let's have a look at an example from this paper in a little bit more detail. This graph explains the control in reproductive activity in male starlings. The dark parts of the graph show changes in the bird's testicular volume. The light gray parts of the graph 
shows the concentrations of GnRH, gonadotrophin releasing hormone, which is a hormone that then releases follicle stimulating hormone, which influences the reproductive cycle by impacting positively on testicular activity. On the graph, we've got photosensitive and photorefractory periods. They are across the different months of the year. When is the bird sensitive to changes in light levels? We've also got non-photoperiod cues, temperature, rainfall, food, as well as social factors and stresses, which are going to influence the reproductive potential of the birds. And we can see that these non-photoperiodic cues are going to influence whether or not the bird actually goes into courtship and breeding behaviours. We have then got influences that affect GnRH production, this hormone that is involved in the activity of the testes themselves. And the influence of GnRH can be downregulated by another hormone, GnIH, gonadotrophin inhibitory hormone. GnIH is a relatively new hormone, having been discovered in the year 2000. It affects the influences of other hormones that are produced for reproduction in a negative manner. It downregulates, for example, the concentrations of GnRH. And it does this in a similar way in mammals and birds, including in the human animal. So we see declines in the concentration of GnRH in the starling when parental behaviour is influencing what they're doing by feeding their young, if they go into molt, or if there are different changes in temperature which reduce the likelihood of breeding being successful. Molt is when a bird changes one set of feathers for another. That's a very energy costly, a very demanding time of year. So consequently, it makes sense that hormones linked to reproductive behaviours would decline to reduce the chances of the bird attempting to breed at a time of its life cycle when it needs to be putting more energy and more effort into maintenance behaviours, i.e. feeding to get lots of energy to grow a new plumage, which it can then use as part of its reproductive behaviours in the following year. So this graph shows the complexity of all of the variables that impact on whether or not a starling will breed on whether or not the starling's physiology will alter to enable reproduction, not just on the endocrine level, but also of external factors too. And therefore, we can see on this graph why breeding is controlled precisely to a particular time of the year, March, April, May, when temperature, rainfall, food, and social conditions are likely to be more favorable for breeding, but then very sharply controlled after the breeding season, once summer is turning into autumn, these hormonal levels drop and therefore the starling's behaviour changes, so it focuses on other types of activities that will keep it alive over the winter. We can see some extreme examples of how animals change what they look like and how they change their behaviour patterns at different times of their physiological year i.e. in and out of the breeding season. These are my ducks that I have at home. I have a pair of wood ducks and I have a pair of mandarins. The male mandarin you can see at the back with the orange and white face. The male wood duck you can see at the front with the red beak and red eye. Those two male birds look incredibly scruffy at the end of summer. They have molted out their colourful plumage which they use for displaying to the females and they've become a more camouflaged grey brown colour to match the plumage of their two respective mates. This behaviour serves two functions. Firstly, when ducks molt, they lose their flight feathers. They lose the ability to fly. So being cryptic is a survival skill for them. Secondly, when their female is on eggs and raising youngsters, they don't need to keep courting her. So they save energy by changing their feathers to look more dowdy they reduce social competition, they reduce social interaction, and therefore they can expend more time and effort growing their next set of breeding feathers for the next breeding season. This is what Mr Mandarin and Mr Wood Duck look like during the courtship season, during autumn and winter. Beautiful bright colours used to attract a female. 
And yes, they are inside because if you leave the conservatory door open, they'll quite happily invite themselves in and make a mess all over the floor. Let's recap what I have explained in this video. Behaviour is the observable response to a stimulus. That stimulus can come from the external environment and that external stimulus can cause a change in the animal's physiology. This can result in an internal stimulus which further directs behaviour. These observable responses allow us to understand behaviour based on the context within which it is performed. We have these internal and external factors that are driving how animals perform particular behaviours and they can also be within a particular seasonal or social context. Because behaviour is subjective, because we are watching and observing, we need to attempt to make it objective. So systematic measurement of behaviour under particular conditions can tell us precisely why that activity is performed. The other thing we've talked about is the idea of motivation and how animals are motivated to perform things at different times of the year, during different seasons, or in different physiological states. And this motivational effect is the same for the human and the non-human animal. An animal has a drive to do something. It's internally motivated to perform that particular behaviour. When we look at these motivated behaviours, we can say they are either an appetitive behaviour and a consummatory behaviour. Appetitive behaviours are where the doing of the behaviour is more important than the end goal. For example, in my rutting stags, the process of going through the rut, of thrashing his antlers around, of bellowing and roaring, is the appetitive behaviour. It is the need to perform that action. The consummatory behaviour is the end result of the action that the animal is performing. Once an animal has performed this consummatory behaviour, it is satiated, i.e. its motivation is fulfilled, it can then go on and do something else. In the case of the rutting stag, the consummatory behaviour would be the mating with the hinds in his harem. He can then go back to performing other behaviours. And we can see in this diagram that there are feedback mechanisms that cause behaviour to occur at particular times. Exogenous and endogenous factors feed back to the animal to change its motivational state, to change its hormonal profile and therefore alter its time activity budget in the most useful and relevant manner to the animal's current setting. Endogenous factors would be things like the hormonal changes that we've explained. Exogenous factors would be things external to the body, for example that could be changes in temperature, it could be changes in the weather, or it could be changes in daylight, day length or social group. All of these things enact pressures on the animal to enable that behaviour to be the most valid and useful within that current context. If the animal is not satiated, we might see the performance of abnormal repetitive behaviours or unhelpful behaviours because the animal is still motivated to perform something but it cannot get rid of that motivation. For example, stags that are unable to compete with each other or are unable to successfully gather together a harem of females can direct their aggression at other non-deer animals around them. For example, human beings that get too close to them. And consequently, that's why you shouldn't get too close to rutting stags if you happen to live near a group of them in your local park. I hope this short presentation has provided you with some useful information on both the physiological and environmental control over behaviour, how it can be controlled very precisely to different times of the year, and why that makes the behaviour valuable and useful to the individual that's performing it. I also hope that this has shown you why it can be very difficult to pull apart the particular variables that are causing the behaviour and then often an animal's activity pattern is a response to a multitude of stimuli that are around it. Thank you.